So good evening and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this session. I'll be able to stay with us by Dr. Paul Dini. As most of you know, Dr. Paul Dini is the professor of physics and cosmology at the Arizona State University. He's a scientist, he's a world renowned broadcaster and a best editor. Yeah. So without further ado, I will invite Dr. Paul Dini we have introduced you to the audience so if you could just give your talk as planned all right uh, shall i start sharing my screen now yes yes, yes. Yes, let me, let me say a few words. Uh, first, I'd like to say hello to everybody uh, and thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, and I, uh, the camera's now been turned so I can now see you and I hope you can see me. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm speaking to you from a town called Chattanooga uh, in the state of Tennessee in the United States. Uh, I don't live there, I live in uh, Arizona, uh, and I work at Arizona State University in Phoenix. Uh, but as you can tell from the way I speak, I am uh, British by birth, and I've lived in Australia for many years. And so uh, it's a good example of the way that science works, uh, that uh, we move from country to country, we go where the science is. Uh, so uh, today, uh, I'm going to talk to you about a subject that everybody is fascinated by, uh, which is uh, whether or not we're alone in the universe. That's one of the oldest and uh, deepest questions of existence. So let me uh, now share my screen. Uh, it says that um, the host has disabled uh, screen sharing, which is not good. Uh, uh, perhaps at your end, you could uh, change that uh, so that I can bring up my PowerPoint slides. Uh, you have disabled my screen sharing, it says. Uh, can you help me? Uh, otherwise, yes, I will have... Please try again. We have enabled it. Uh, so if I try... Ah, here we are. Sure. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Because of COVID, I think we all became quite skilled at, uh, at using Zoom for presentation. So let's hope uh, that we can proceed now without too much difficulty. Um, uh, so uh, let me say that uh, for thousands of years, the question of whether or not we are alone in the universe was really uh, entirely in the province of theology and philosophy. But a few decades ago, science became part of this quest. And in particular, uh, the work of this uh, man here, his name is Frank Drake. Uh, in 1960, he began uh, sweeping the skies with uh, a radio telescope in the hope of picking up uh, some sort of uh, message, <coughs> excuse me, from an extraterrestrial civilization. Very sadly, Frank Drake died just a few weeks ago. Now this subject is called SETI in English. Um, that's the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And over the decades, it expanded uh, from not just one radio telescope, but uh, for many around the world. This is a famous one in Australia. And you might well recognize this one, uh, uh, which is no longer being used. Uh, this is the Arecibo radio telescope in Puerto Rico. Uh, and these have been used uh, from time to time uh, to listen in to uh, stars in our galaxy in the hope that there might be some radio message coming our way. And the principle here is uh, straightforward uh, physics. The, uh, these uh, dishes have the power to communicate by radio uh, not just over terrestrial distances, but truly interplanetary distances. So if there is a civilization out there beaming messages our way, 
these dishes have the ability to pick those messages up. Uh, but after about 60 years of effort, uh, there has been no success. There is nothing uh, but an eerie silence uh, out there in the galaxy. So does that mean we are doing something wrong? Are we looking for the wrong thing in the wrong place at the wrong time? Or does it lead us to conclude that we are in fact alone in the universe? Well, the idea that there may be uh, life, in, indeed intelligent life, beyond Earth is a very ancient one. Uh, for example, the Roman poet uh, Lucretius uh, wrote uh, over 2,000 years ago, other worlds exist in other regions of the sky and different tribes of men, somewhat sexist there, uh, kinds of wild beasts. Uh, and so that's a very old idea and it's based on the notion uh, that uh, the that the stars and uh, uh, any planets are made out of the same atoms as the Earth is made out of, and that if these atoms can come together to form living things here on Earth, then that should be possible elsewhere too. So it was a very general argument. It wasn't really a scientific argument, just a philosophical one. Uh, but the search for life beyond Earth, uh, intelligent life, um, it, it had to wait for, for many more centuries. And another landmark event was uh, this uh, uh, gentleman here, uh, Percival Lowell, who in 1894 built an observatory in Arizona. This is about three hours to the north of where I live. Uh, it's the Lowell Observatory, and he built it because he was convinced that there is life on Mars, not just life, but intelligent life, and that the Martians have built canals on the surface of the planet and he even drew these elaborate maps and uh, in his book says that, that Mars is inhabited by beings of some sort or other we may consider as certain, as it is uncertain what these beings may be. So uh, this was the mood at the end of the 19th century. And I think um, it probably led to the H.G. Uh, uh, the Wells famous um, novel War of the Worlds. Uh, but in the 1970s, uh, NASA, the US Space Agency, sent two spacecraft to land on the surface of the Mars, of Mars, and they didn't find any canals. In fact, what they found was, uh, shown in this picture here, a freeze-dried desert uh, bathed in deadly ultraviolet radiation and with soils uh, that uh, very hostile to any form of life, including microbial life. Uh, and so the idea that Mars may have some sort of life uh, really faded, although it remains a possibility that there is some form of microbes living uh, perhaps beneath the surface where they're protected from the harsh conditions. Uh, that remains an open question. But we know that there isn't any intelligent life on Mars and certainly no canals. Uh, but of course, Mars is just one planet. Uh, and in the past uh, 20, 30 years, astronomers have discovered uh, that there are not just the planets in our solar system, but a vast number of planets going around other stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, in fact, the feeling now is that almost all stars, almost all of the 400 billion stars in the Milky Way do indeed have planets of some sort. And so uh, we can estimate the number of these planets that might be rather like Earth and therefore might, uh, might to spawn life of some sort. And uh, this is not a precise science, but estimates often place this number in, uh, in the millions or even billions. And so as Americans might say, uh, there's plenty of real estate out there on which life might arise. But it's important to recognize that uh, if a planet is habitable, that does not mean it's inhabited. For a planet which can support life uh, to actually have life, then life has to arise on it. Uh, that seems like a rather trivial statement, but you'd be amazed how many journalists and uh, even scientists forget that just because a, 
planet might be able to uh, support life, that there is life on it, uh, that life has to arise in some way on that planet. And if life it can jump from one planet to another, maybe it can spread across the galaxy, um, that seems unlikely. Uh, so uh, we're talking about life originating from scratch on, uh, on these other planets, if they are to be inhabited. Now, um, many years ago, Frank Drake, this is the same Frank Drake, uh, wrote down uh, this uh, famous Drake equation. It's not an equation like uh, in physics, it's really a list of things that we, we need to know to estimate the number there on the left, uh, capital N, uh, that is the number of communicating civilizations in our galaxy, just our galaxy, the Milky Way at this time. Um, and the, the terms there, let me just uh, uh, summarize it here. Um, they fall into three types. There's uh, terms which describe the um, uh, astronomical circumstances, as this is astronomy. Then there's terms that describe biology. And then there's more difficult terms that describe things, how long, how long will a civilization last? These are sort of sociological or technological uh, terms. And we don't know what those numbers are. Um, and when Frank Drake wrote this equation down many decades ago, uh, all of those terms were a bit uncertain. But the terms in the green box, we now know relatively well. Um, the, the really difficult term there is this one F sub L. That's the fraction of planets uh, which are Earth-like on which life actually emerges. So that's the origin of life I was talking about. Now, when I was a student, uh, the uh, opinion among leading scientists was that life on Earth is a bizarre freak, uh, a chemical fluke of such unlikelihood, such improbability, that it wouldn't happen twice in the universe. And that was summed up rather well by Francis Crick, the co-discoverer of the structure of DNA, so a very famous scientist. Life seems almost a miracle, he said, so many other conditions for it to get going. Um, but 20 years later, uh, another Nobel Prize winning biologist uh, came up with the opposite conclusion, that life is almost bound to arise, he wrote, wherever physical conditions are similar to those on Earth. And he had a wonderful phrase, life is a cosmic imperative. So in just 20 years, the opinion of the scientific community has shifted from uh, life being almost impossible anywhere beyond Earth uh, to the idea that the universe is teeming with life. And yet our understanding of how life began uh, still remains very unclear. Now, Charles Darwin himself uh, wrote, it is mere rubbish thinking of present of the origin of life, one might as well think of the origin of matter. Um, and the point I want to make uh, is that if you don't know the process that turned non-life into life, if we don't know what it is, we can't estimate the probability. So that term, F sub L, the fraction of Earth-like planets on which life emerges, is a complete unknown. Uh, it could lie anywhere on a spectrum from life being a bizarre fluke to some inevitable product of self-organizing processes. Uh, we simply don't know uh, what it is. But how can we test the idea of the Duve's cosmic imperative, uh, that life is bound to arise in Earth-like conditions? Well, obviously, one way uh, we would confirm that is if we did discover life beyond Earth. But so far, we haven't done that. So is there something else we can do whilst we're waiting? Uh, well, we could look right here on Earth for a second genesis of life. Uh, there's no planet more Earth-like than Earth itself. And so if life does start easily, surely it should have started many times right here on our home planet. How do we know it didn't? Has anybody actually looked? And uh, remarkably, when I became interested in this subject, about 15 years ago, and I ran a, a conference at Arizona State University, uh, I was astonished to find that um, not only had nobody really thought about this, uh, but that there were many scientists who 
uh, regarded it as a good idea that we should uh, search our own planet for life, but not as we know it. Um, and so the idea here is, uh, you know, I'm sure you all know about the tree of life, the, the metaphor Darwin gave us. Uh, I'm talking not about another branch, uh, an alien branch, so to speak, on the tree of life, but another tree entirely. Uh, and uh, the, the idea here is that if life did start many times on Earth, maybe the descendants of another genesis, and there may be many, uh, are still with us today in microbial form. Most life uh, on Earth is uh, microbial. We don't know what those microbes are, the, the, a very large number. It's impossible to culture them or even uh, or to sequence them. Uh, and so it's not impossible that intermingled with the microbes that are all around us in our environment are some uh, which are uh, have radically different biochemistry and suggest an independent origin that they started from scratch a long time ago, um, right here on Earth. If we found even one such microbe, just one, uh, it would show that life has happened more than once and therefore it's likely to be widespread in the universe. But let me come back to this problem of SETI because when I talk about life on Earth, most people want to know about intelligent life. Now, there's an obvious problem with uh, the traditional way of doing SETI, of using a radio telescope uh, to uh, look for messages from uh, civilization, uh, that unless these messages are beamed directly at us, they have to be directed towards us, uh, we don't have instruments powerful enough to pick up those radio signals. So they have to, the aliens have to know we are here. And the problem about that is that uh, unless they're very close, they wouldn't know we are here. They may know that there is intelligent life on Earth, even from a thousand light years away. Uh, you could probably, be big instruments, you could see the Great Wall of China or the pyramids in Egypt, uh, early signs of agriculture, and so on. But uh, imagine if you're a thousand light years away. You see Earth as it was a thousand years ago. Light, uh, you can't uh, see anything faster than light. Uh, and so it takes light a thousand years to travel to this civilization, this hypothetical civilization. Uh, in the, the same way it takes our early radio uh, signals, uh, they travel at the speed of light, and they've only gone about a hundred light years out into space. So unless this alien civilization knows we have radio technology, they wouldn't bother to send messages our way. So that's a real problem about traditional SETI. Uh, they really don't know we are here. And by we, I mean radio astronomers. They don't know we have radio astronomy yet, unless they're very close uh, in astronomical terms. Um, but we don't, of course, have to pick up a message from a civilization to conclude uh, that we're not alone. Uh, we merely need to detect some sort of sign of technology that is not human uh, so, or not uh, obviously not natural origin. And this is known as the search for techno signatures. That's the buzzword now that's being used. So uh, if we saw something like this, of course, it would be obvious or something like this, we would conclude uh, that this could not occur naturally. Um, one idea that's taken quite seriously is the notion of the Dyson sphere. Um, Freeman Dyson suggested in 1960 that a very advanced civilization might have, might engage in what we would call astro engineering. It could modify not just its planet, but its entire astronomical environment, perhaps creating a sphere to trap all of the heat and light uh, of its host star. Uh, I often say that that is um, a solar energy project with a vengeance. Um, and people have looked for Dyson spheres, and a few years ago, there was a flurry of excitement that maybe one had been discovered uh, by this uh, female astronomer, Tabitha Boyan, uh, and uh, sometimes this is called Tabby's star. It's a, a star that is behaving very unusually, uh, and um, sometimes uh, you, you see pictures that artists have drawn as to what might be going on with this star, there's some sort of alien megastructure around it. Now I have to say that uh, we love talking about these ideas. I say we astronomers love talking speculatively about such things, 
uh, but we don't seriously believe uh, that this is good evidence uh, for an extraterrestrial civilization. But it's the type of thing that we might look for. Um, the other thing is that uh, we don't, don't give up on looking for radio uh, because uh, one way in which humans communicate is uh, something more like a lighthouse, which sweeps the horizon. Uh, and it doesn't, it's not directed at any particular ship. Uh, it just is that if there's anybody out there, uh, they can pick up the horizon beam, uh, the, um, the uh, lighthouse beam, and it's a, it's a message of some sort. So is it possible that an alien civilization, uh, perhaps close to the center of the galaxy where most of the stars are, uh, many years ago, built a beacon uh, uh, that sweeps the plane of the Milky Way with radio or light waves, maybe laser pulses, uh, <clears throat> sweeping around and repeating once every so often. Uh, and so that wouldn't be so much a message deliberately directed at Earth. It just would be sent out to anybody who is there. And um, there's a famous example uh, from the SETI literature. You can look it up in 1977. It's called the wow signal when a pulse lasting 70 something seconds <clears throat> was detected by a SETI astronomer um, after the event. And this is a, a, a trace of the record uh, which was uh, produced by the radio telescope uh, back in the days when uh, these things were done on the sheets of paper. Uh, so it's called the wow signal because it was never really explained as an astronomical phenomenon. But nobody has uh, heard anything from that part of the sky since. Um, let me now address the question that often comes up in newspapers and popular accounts. Uh, is uh, ET lurking in our cosmic backyard? Is it conceivable that some sort of um, alien a visitation or alien probe uh, might have occurred uh, or be occurring now right here in the solar system, not on right on the other side of the galaxy, but right in our solar system. Uh, is that credible? Um, well, many years ago, uh, Enrico Fermi, the famous physicist, uh, asked the question, where are they in collection with the aliens? And he was making the following point, that if it's true that our galaxy is teeming with life and that at least some fraction of those planets will have intelligent life with technology uh, capable of space travel, uh, then there's been plenty of time in the history of the galaxy for that civilization to spread right across the galaxy and to colonize it, much as humans spread out of Africa and colonized the whole of our planet Earth. Uh, so uh, an advanced civilization would surely colonize the whole galaxy and they would already be here. And this is based on the fact that our solar system is only about one third of the age of the universe. There were stars and planets around and potentially life uh, billions of years before Earth even came into existence. So there has been plenty of time, even at the slow speeds of space travel, for a civilization to spread across the galaxy. And yet, uh, Fermi observed, Earth had not been taken over a long time ago by aliens. Uh, so therefore he concluded there were none. Um, so what about all those reports of UFOs, uh, which get people so excited? Uh, every day people report seeing strange things in the sky. And in the folklore, uh, there is a belief that our planet is indeed being visited, that the aliens are here. It's just they haven't taken over uh, our planet at this stage. Uh, and uh, this, uh, these reports of flying objects in the skies go back uh, many decades. And I've closely followed this subject over the years. Uh, and I'm going to tell you my opinion about it in a moment. But just uh, last year, uh, this, uh, due to a flurry of new um, sightings uh, in the United States, the something called the Director of National Intelligence uh, produced a report for the United States Congress uh, assessing these unidentified aerial phenomena, which is what 
people prefer to call used to call UFOs. Uh, and the conclusion uh, was, well, there were some uh, difficult to explain cases, but that it uh, should be investigated further. There wasn't any very obvious threat to the United States. But of course, um, if Earth is being visited uh, by extraterrestrials, then that's just as much an issue for Pakistan as it is for the United States. Uh, so we have to take a global view of this. Now, um, part of the reason, and what do I think about this? Well, I'm very skeptical that, uh, that these reports are due to alien visitation for a number of reasons. Now, let me just show you this remarkable picture. Uh, I took this picture myself, well, my wife did, to be honest, uh, just two nights ago outside our house in Arizona. Uh, this very strange looking object. There are actually two of them. Uh, and uh, it left me uh, very uncertain as to what I was looking at. Um, my, we live uh, rather close to an airport and there were lots of planes flying around uh, and often they'll turn their lights on as they approach the airport. But the, uh, uh, this, my first thought, well, this is uh, simply the lights from the plane um, uh, sh shining through the, uh, the clouds or the mist. Uh, but uh, the problem was that the object was moving uh, to the left, as you see it. Uh, and I thought, well, the plane, you know, would be a strange plane that would shine its lights backward uh, behind it, uh, unless it was some sort of advertising stunt. You know, maybe this was a commercial operation going on. Uh, but the uh, fact is that this scene from our house, it looked like this object was uh, heading towards the airport, and indeed it disappeared in that direction. And um, I, I was uh, fooled for a, for a while, uh, but I tell you what it turned out to be. Uh, this is the uh, this is a rocket. Uh, it's the launch by the company SpaceX of um, uh, some Starlink satellites, and it's being launched from California. So this uh, was not an object uh, close by, a uh, few kilometers away over our airport. It was actually in another state altogether, uh, but of course very high up and heading into orbit. So it, it, the point is, it's very easy to see something. Uh, in the sky and I conclude it must be uh, alien visitation or something uh, mysterious uh, because it's hard for humans to interpret things seen out of context. The other reason that I don't take seriously these uh, reports is because our planet has been here for four and a half billion years. If aliens have wanted to come here uh, and if they, they want our planet, they could have taken it at any time. Why would they just show up just in the last uh, few decades, uh, just by coincidence as we become aware of the possibility of life beyond Earth? That just seems too much of a coincidence. Um, however, I don't rule out the possibility that in the history of our planet, uh, there, there may have been alien technology. Uh, I'm, I don't think it doesn't have to necessarily be the aliens themselves. I, we don't need to think about flesh and blood beings uh, visiting us. It could just be their technology. Um, and then we can ask, are there any traces that that may have left which would endure uh, for a hundred uh, million years, for example? Uh, to be op optimistic, if it was billions of years ago, we wouldn't know. Um, well, there are three things that occur to me. One is uh, buried nuclear waste, if there was some nuclear fuel uh, that um, uh, that was dumped, we could, uh, that would still survive after 100 million years. Uh, if there was large scale mining or quarrying, uh, or if there was some interruption of uh, evolution of life on Earth through biotechnology, these are all things with downstream consequences that would survive for an immense period of time. Um, I don't have a great deal of time to tell you about this. I'm going to go rather quickly through uh, these examples. If we found a lump of plutonium, uh, somewhere, say on the moon or on Mars, um, uh, then we could be sure that this had artificial origin because plutonium uh, doesn't survive in the solar system naturally uh, for that length of time. Uh, and so plutonium on Earth is all man-made. Um, if we found it somewhere else, it uh, would be alien. Um, if we saw something like this, uh, an asteroid with uh, mining or terracing 
uh, humans are now thinking about mining asteroids for their minerals. If we saw that somebody had already done that, it would be very clear. Um, and the last one, this intriguing idea, uh, supposing uh, that instead of sending us a radio message, um, the aliens had uh, done the, proverb the proverbial equivalent, the equivalent of a proverbial message in a bottle. Uh, in this case, uh, the bottle might be living cells and the message might be etched into DNA. Uh, and because genomes are being sequenced all the time and they're free on the internet, uh, we can search through that vast database for anything that looks uh, strange, uh, like the one I picked out there, which of course I faked. Uh, that is a sequence of prime numbers written in the four letter alphabetic DNA. Um, is it possible uh, to embed messages in DNA? Absolutely. Uh, human beings are doing this now on a routine basis. Gene editing technology enables us to, uh, to put things in DNA. Uh, Craig Venter uh, first uh, did this by putting poetry and I think his email address into uh, DNA of, uh, uh, of a microbe. Uh, and uh, the biologist George Church has, I think, even uploaded uh, the content of one of his books uh, into the DNA of E. coli bacteria. So humans can certainly upload information into DNA. Uh, maybe the aliens uh, can do that too, or did it? a long time ago, maybe a hundred million years ago, and we could still look for that today uh, in, uh, in living cells. Now, this is obviously very speculative. I don't expect we will actually find such a thing, but uh, it costs us nothing to look, and we may discover something else of significance. So I'm a great fan uh, of being uh, a, an interested skeptic. To be skeptical about something, but open-minded and to investigate. Uh, I'm going to finish just by asking briefly what is um, uh, an alien civilization like? You know, what would the aliens look like? Would it be the, the Hollywood version, um, the uh, like in the movie Avatar, uh, human-like beings, um, or would it be uh, something like um, uh, robots? Uh, and um, the point being that on Earth, uh, the heavy lifting of intelligence is now increasingly being done by machines, by computers that can play chess better than us, uh, can do mathematics better than us, and increasingly making decisions uh, about day-to-day -day things better than humans. So if we imagine in another million years on Earth, almost all of the intellectual work will be done by design systems. But I'm not sure uh, robots are, are really the right sort of image that we should be showing. Um, we could imagine the entire surface of a planet uh, being taken up by a network of information processing systems, uh, networked computers, if you like. Uh, the, the point about artificial intelligence is that there are no bounds on it. Uh, it uh, there are bounds on human intelligence just because of the size of our heads. Uh, they have to, uh, it has to come out of the human body but artificial intelligence could just be scaled up without limit. So we can imagine a vast uh, network on a planet like this. Um, and we can go beyond that because of the promise of something called a, a quantum computer. Uh, the holy grail in the computing industry at the moment is the possibility of building a computer that uses quantum mechanical superpositions and entanglement uh, would have a pow the power um, uh, of even a, 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 I should say uh, that the increase in the power uh, represented by a quantum computer is uh, as great as that of a conventional supercomputer over an abacus. So we're talking about uh, a huge, huge leap in information processing possibility. Uh, and this is uh, something, the idea that we would have an intelligent quantum computer uh, which my colleague at Arizona State University, Frank Wilczek, calls quintelligence. Uh, and if uh, the dominant uh, intelligence out there in the universe is quintelligence, uh, then why am I showing you a picture of a taxi? Um, the reason for that is that a quantum computer might be no bigger than a typical taxi. Uh, and uh, it could be located anywhere 
in the universe and the best place is not in the galaxy altogether but in the intergalactic spaces where it's cooler the temperature is much lower which is good for quantum computing um, and then the problem is that the uh, that the chances of us ever detecting such a thing are very remote so unless this quintelligence really would like to reach out to us there is almost no possibility we're going to know that it's there which is very sad and it, it leads me to just conclude by asking, well, why do we do SETI if it's so hopeless uh, in trying to detect uh, advanced post-biological uh, intelligence, which surely would dominate the universe? And I think uh, the answer I'm going to leave in the words of Frank Wilczek, we do, of um, Frank Drake, we do SETI because SETI is a search for ourselves. It's really trying to understand who we are um, and where we fit in for this magnificent universe of, of ours. Uh, and that brings me to the end of my talk, and I'd be very happy to take questions if there are any. Thank you so much, Paul. So, um, we will open the floor for questions. If any one of you has any questions for Dr. Paul Davis, please raise your hand and Doug will come to you with the mic. Any questions, please raise your hand. The question is under the Uksa Banwalo. Uksa Banwalo is the question you must ask. I can see a, a, a young man and a young lady sitting in the front row who would like to ask a question, and I'd uh, love to hear what they have to say. Dr. Paul, can you hear us? Yes, I can. All right, so I have a little question. Uh, mm -hmm. Since the search for extraterrestrial intelligence uh, up that the people who are active researchers in this field must have us does not count as intelligent. So where do you set the bar? Is it that like the philosophical philosophical concept of consciousness? What do you, uh, what do scientists consider intelligent in terms of civilization? Thank you. That is my question. Yes. Yeah. Well, you've asked a very profound question, and uh, people who work in this field of SETI uh, make it very clear that what they're really looking for is uh, alien technology. It's called uh, extraterrestrial intelligence, um, but the definition of intelligence is a difficult one. And uh, if we require that intelligent life or intelligent um, computers uh, should be conscious, and that gets us into uh, the very murky territory of what is consciousness and what is intelligence. So uh, there's no, no attempt in the SETI research project to answer those questions. It's simply a search for uh, any sort of uh, non-human technology. I gave this term techno signatures. Uh, and uh, I personally, in my own research, am very interested in the nature of consciousness, the origin of consciousness, I think is one of the great unsolved problems of science. Uh, and um, it's, it's even harder to solve that one than the problem of the origin of life. So SETI really doesn't get too involved uh, in those sorts of questions. So, um... Thank you again, Dr. Paul, for taking out the time for this, even in uh, time zone for you. And we are also closing down the Lahore Science Mela publicly right now. It's 5 p.m. And thank you once again for sparing your precious time for us and uh, hope that we can do another session, maybe in person the next time. Thank you. And thank yes, you it's been my pleasure. Thank you.